and scripture passages in the bulletin in front of you. I would invite you to follow along as together we read and we hear God's holy word appointed for this day. The Old Testament lesson comes from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 1 through 10. Isaiah has just finished an oracle of destruction of the nations, and now he promises restoration of the promised land and the joyful return of the exiles to Jerusalem. The desert and the dry land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. They will burst into bloom and rejoice with joy and singing. They will receive the glory of Lebanon, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the Lord's glory, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and support the unsteady knees. Say to those who are panicking, be strong, don't fear. Here's your God coming with vengeance. With divine retribution, God will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be cleared. Then the lame will leap like the deer and the tongue of the speechless will sing. Waters will spring up in the desert and springs in the wilderness. The burning sand will become a pool and the thirsty ground fountains of water. The jackal's habitat, a pasture, and grass will become reeds and rushes. A highway will be there. It will be called the holy way. The unclean won't travel on it, but it will be for those walking on that way. Even fools will get lost on it. No lion will be there, and no predator will go up on it. None of these will be there. Only the redeemed will walk on it. The Lord's ransomed ones will return and enter Zion with singing, with everlasting joy upon their heads. Happiness and joy will overwhelm them. Grief and groaning will flee away. Here ends the reading of the Old Testament lesser. And the Psalter lesson this morning that we read responsively is um, known as a hymn of Mary. You remember she's received the announcement that she will have Jesus one who will be the savior to the world. She is overwhelmed by this announcement from Gabriel, the angel, but she responds in singing this hymn. And scholars believe if you look to another psalm, you find that this hymn is very similar to a psalm uh, in the collection of the psalms. But we read it responsively today in the joy and in the spirit of being overwhelmed as Mary would have been as she had received this information and announcement. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God my Savior. He has looked with favor on the low status of his servant. Look. From now on, everyone will consider me highly favored because the Mighty One has, great, has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He shows mercy to everyone, from one generation to the next, who honors him as God. He has shown strength with his arm. And he has scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations. He has pulled the powerful down. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty away. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy, just as he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants forever. 
And the epistle reading is from James chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. James exhorts his readers and listeners to wait patiently for the Lord. Some of us need to hear this lesson. Therefore, brothers and sisters, you must be patient as you wait for the coming of the Lord. Consider the farmer who waits patiently for the coming of rain in the fall and spring, looking forward to the precious fruit of the earth. You also must wait patiently, strengthening your resolve, because the coming of the Lord is near. Don't complain about each other, brothers and sisters, so you won't be judged. Look, the judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of patient resolve and steadfastness. Here ends the reading of the Psalter lesson. Will you please stand for the reading of the gospel? <clears throat> the gospel lesson according to Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. John the Baptist, uh, as you know, during Advent appears twice, last week and today. He's been arrested. He's been imprisoned. He's discouraged. He has doubt. And so he sends messengers to Jesus to ask, are you the promised one? Now when John heard in prison about the things Jesus was doing, he sent word by his disciples to Jesus asking, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? Jesus responded, Go report to John what you hear and see. Those who are blind are able to see. Those who are crippled are walking. People with skin diseases are cleansed. Those who were deaf now hear. Those who were dead are raised up. The poor have good news promised and proclaimed to them. Happy are those who don't stumble and fall because of me. Now when John's disciples had gone, Jesus spoke to the crowds about John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A stalk blowing in the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in refined clothes? Look, those who wear refined clothes are in royal palaces. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. He is the one to whom it is written. Look, I'm sending my messenger before you who will prepare your way before you. I assure you that no one who has ever been born is greater than John the Baptist. Yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is the word of God for the people of Christ. Thanks be to God. Remain standing as we sing our hymn of preparation, hymn number 218.
be seated. Let us pray. O oh God, for the light that comes after a day of rain, we give thanks. But we gather this morning to worship the true light, Jesus the Christ. And as we remember his coming into the world, and as we anticipate his return, may our joy be strengthened, and may we truly bear the light of Christ to the world. It is in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Have you ever had your expectations not met? <laughs> what happened? Was it that it was your 60th birthday and you anticipated a big party from your spouse and they didn't pull it off? Or was it that you had reminded your children multiple times, this is the gift I want? Nothing else, nothing less, nothing more. And when you opened the package, it was nothing close to what you had asked. In our household, it is, will you please keep stuff in its place? If you would give that as a gift, that would be huge. How about your expectations around God and what you have asked of God and they somehow didn't seem met to you. Some of you will remember this because I remember reading about it. It made the AP Press and remember being horrified but a few years ago a wide receiver for the Buffalo Bills, Steve Johnson, does that ring a bell with anybody? He voiced his surprise on Twitter when things didn't turn out the way he had hoped during, of all things, a football game. He dropped a potentially game-winning touchdown pass. It was overtime. And the Pittsburgh Steelers won. And the AP Press picked up the story of his tweet where he blamed God, and this is what he said. I praise you 24-7. And this is how you do me? You expect me to learn from this? I'll never forget this, ever. Thanks, though. If any of us sitting here this morning think that the theology of praising God brings favor or brings reward, then our theology is not on line with Scripture. Maybe this football player ought to be commended for at least his honesty because the truth be told, many of us who are Christians have felt that way at one time or another when we thought we were in close communication, we thought we were praising God and living a life worthy of Christ. And then somehow our expectations weren't met. Maybe it was simply God doesn't like buffalo. (laughs) 
enough of that. In the New Testament, the Gospel reading this morning, John the Baptist's world had shrunk. He had been imprisoned. And John the Baptist had been so filled with righteous prophecy. He had preached of one who was to come. He had preached of one who was going to set the captives free. He had even baptized this one, even though he didn't feel worthy to baptize him. And here he is, a captive, dependent upon someone else to bring him a drink of water. And while in his time of prophecy he was so sure that Jesus was the one, now with this time upon his hands, he wonders, are you the one to come? Really? And Matthew writes in his gospel that when John heard what Jesus, the Messiah, was doing, actually Matthew could have written, when John heard that the Messiah Jesus was not doing what John had expected, somehow John the Baptist had expected Jesus to follow the outline that so many other Jews had anticipated. A step-by-step -step successful plan for messianic ministry and the overthrow of the Roman government. And sitting in prison, aware that probably he was going to be killed, yes, by one of the horrific manners of death, beheading. As you remember, John the Baptist dared to even speak out against King Herod and his adulterous marriage. I'm sure if I had been John the Baptist, I would have been thinking the same thing. Come on, Jesus, let's get the fire burning and let's throw Herod on it first. And John the Baptist knew he had preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Yet, facing tragedy in his own life, John the Baptist is hearing reports of Jesus pronouncing forgiveness, healing the sick, bringing good news to the poor. And so John the Baptist was somewhat uncertain, needed some assurance. And so he sends some of his friends who have been visiting him, obviously, to go and ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come, the one we have hoped for, or should we continue to hope for someone else? Doesn't that sound like an honest question, especially of someone facing his own death? And after all, John the Baptist in prison News traveling by word of mouth had heard strange things, unexpected things. And so John the Baptist needed an answer. In the season of Advent, no doubt each of us sitting here this morning and Christians gathered around the world today 
we bring expectations about the Savior that we want. Some people want a Savior who breathes fire and brimstone and who points out what everyone is doing that is wrong. And others want a Savior who will champion our favorite cause Or a God that we can be certain is on our side. And others of us want a gentle Savior who will walk beside us and comfort us and assure us of his love for us. And all of those images are correct images, perhaps, of the Messiah. But the problem is sometimes we want one and not the full picture that continues to be revealed in Jesus the Christ. And when we focus in on a limited view of Jesus and we limit him, then we bump up against the reports of what he is doing in scripture. Jesus, the real Messiah, Lord, shepherd, friend, redeemer. But sometimes you and I will bump up against difficult places and times in our life. And it's at those times that I will ask myself, I hope, do I want to follow the living Christ? Or do I want to worship the idea of who I think he should be? There's a big difference. Do I want to follow the living Christ? Or do I want to follow my limited ideas? Do I want the thrill and the challenge and the hope and, yes, the difficulty of following the living Christ? Or do I merely want the comforting, loving, gentle shepherd? That was what John was facing in the passage today. He wondered, is Jesus really the one in whom I have hoped? And so he went directly to the source, or as directly as he could go. He sent his disciples, and instead of making assumptions, or staying in the dark. He had his disciples ask Jesus, are you the one? And you and I, during Advent season, are invited to do the same. To go with our questions, our concerns, are wondering, are you the Messiah? Are you the one who came into the world to save me from my sins? And if we're willing to ask that question personally, we also need to be willing to know that the person that we think is not so great that Jesus also came to save them. And that Jesus has his arms wide open to all of us to come in a personal way 
and confess him as Lord and Savior of our lives. But I have a problem in how so many today confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, wear a cross around their neck, and they never gather in Christian community. Church and the community of faith is low on their priority. Study of scripture is very low on their priority. Prayers are limited to self-interest. A transforming relationship with Jesus takes us from that kind of beginning infancy to a place where we participate with others in worshiping God, praising God, and proclaiming Jesus Christ as Savior of the world and living it so that others see Jesus in us. I just got an amen out of Ruth. Do you want to say amen louder? Amen. <laughs> I don't care what kind of jewelry I wear. In fact, the tragedy is that just like John, people might come asking about some of us who are brave to wear such jewelry. Are you really a disciple of Jesus? The way you judge me, the way you look the other way when you see me in need. Maybe sometimes Jesus doesn't give us what we ask. He gives us the fire of the Holy Spirit. He seeks out sinners. He forgives them. He even lets the unworthy receive his grace. Grace upon grace. John struggled in prison to see this new in-breaking work of God in the Messiah, the promised one of Jesus. And who wouldn't locked away in a prison cell facing death? So he asked, and in the reply that Jesus sent to John, John and all of us get this beautiful message, a message of joy. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. And the dead are raised. And the poor have good news brought to them. Joy. Rejoice. Joy. For Jesus the Messiah is among us and working even this day. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. amen. I would invite you to continue and worship with me as we take our hymnals and turn in the back to respond to our statement of faith, which is on page number 883. Will you stand as we affirm what we believe using this statement of faith from the United Church of Canada? We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus 
the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. come to that time in worship where we share our prayer concerns, believing that God hears our prayers and that God responds. I have several um, praises and prayer concerns to share with you. I'll start with some praises. Uh, some of you have seen a picture of Jack Jeter. Catherine has sent several to me now, celebrating Jack's um, good recovery. Uh, some of you know he had a shoulder replacement repaired and um, Catherine and Jack just have incredible spirits don't they and so we give thanks to God for that uh, also we give thanks to God for how well Mary June Warren is doing look at her um, I we've been praying for her, but I think we need to say thank you God and praise God for the work he's doing in her life and for how well she is tolerating her treatment as she celebrates holding a grandson, a little baby. What a wonderful time of year to hold a little baby, right, Mary Jean? Um, I also have great news to bring. Mima Doyle, uh, as some of you know, was back in the hospital, very sick. Uh, I saw her this week. She had just finished a very long walk. Um, was doing great. Her spirit is incredible. And um, she said to me, my goal now is to be home in six months because I figure by then Rick will have thoroughly destroyed the house <laughs> and I'll need to be there to get it straightened out. Doesn't that sound like her? And so she said, please ask people to pray that I can get the ability to get in and out of bed by myself. That's her struggle, is to get in and out of bed. That getting up and down uh, independently is her big hurdle. So I would ask that we would be in prayer uh, for Emma. She looks uh, so much better, and I uh, celebrate that. Also, another celebration, uh, Margaret um, Smith sent me an email this week about John Horton, and she said, we are praising God because today, when John Horton took the bandage off, there is no wound anymore. It's completely healed. And she said, we're waiting now. He doesn't take any more antibiotics. We're waiting to go back to the doctor. They're not doing weekly uh, blood draws to see what his levels are for his white blood cell count. We go back to see the infectious disease doctor in January and we are praying for a full and complete recovery. And some of you who work in health care know that is miraculous. So praise be to God. Uh, now for those concerns we need to hold in prayer. Uh, some of us early this morning received an email from Marty. Rochelle Kirshner had sent an email to her about her nephew's wife who uh, chose to take her life tragically and that family um, as many of us couldn't even begin to imagine, is dealing with an unbelievable sadness. So uh, we hold that family in our prayers. Uh, Marty also included in that prayer uh, request 
a prayer for um, the um, Ryan's uh, daughter and son-in-law and a situation that they're facing and a need uh, that they have. I think that's their daughter, Terry, right? It's the daughter, Terry, in Atlanta. And then also another situation she named with a financial uh, need, and so we pray for that uh, situation as well. What other prayer concerns do you bring um, that you would ask us to remember? Beth, we continue to remember your sister-in-law, who will finish up radiation treatment and then have a month off and resume chemo for three more months. Are there other prayer concerns that any of you would have us remember? Yes, Marty. For the Gill family, you remember um, the uh, some of you know the mother and her daughter died and that family dealing with the loss of their mother during the holiday season. Um, many people that I know dealing with recent losses during this holiday season. By the way, the Gill family uh, sent a very generous donation to this church to say thank you for your prayers uh, during their time of need and as we continue to hold them in prayer. Are there others? Let us prepare. Yes, Mary Jean. I would like to just say happy birthday to Marty Young. Today is her birthday. <laughs> we give thanks to those of you who've had uh, birthdays. Aren't we glad that God gave us life, even when it's difficult, as Marty's life has been in the last year? But we are glad. Marty, you look uh, good. Uh, <laughs> she just told us her age. <laughs> thanks be to God for the ability to laugh, but also thanks be to God for his strength that has enabled you to make it through this year and has been good and graceful uh, to you, as he has been to many of us. Let us join in this time of preparation of prayer as we sing the chorus. God of true light, we come this morning knowing that as we offer ourselves and all those concerns we bring, that you hear every sigh and thought we utter. And when we offer it to you in prayer, you provide answers. Sometimes the answers we receive are difficult to bear. They require us to seek your strength and to bear up. And other times, oh God, they are prayers that offer a sigh of relief that something that has troubled us and concerned us has now been answered. Oh God, we do offer you praise and thanksgiving for the ways in which you have worked in Jack Jeter's life, for the ways in which you are working in Mema Doyle's life, in Mary June's life, in John Horton's life. 
We praise you, O oh God, for the ways you work and give us another year of life. O oh God, how blessed we are to be here in this place alive and sheltered and called out to be your light to others. We pray as well, O oh God, for those who need your special presence this day. For Cheryl's nephew's family. For the Ryan's daughter's family. For Terry and her husband and their daughter. We pray for Sherry Minnick and her recovery. <coughs> we pray for those who are living with deep sadness, but who live with the knowledge that their loved ones are now present with you in heaven. We pray for Arlene and her family, for the Gill family. Especially, O oh God, we pray for children who are impacted by death at this time of year. We pray for those, O oh God, who face difficulty financially, for those in this congregation who are praying for children and grandchildren. And I give thanks, O oh God, along with many others, for the outpouring of generosity of people in this congregation who make it possible for us as a congregation to witness to the love of God by reaching out to those in need and helping them. Oh God, may our acts of love in your name be used to bear the light of Christ. It is in the name of Jesus the Messiah we pray, as he taught us when we pray to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue in worship as the ushers come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings. Mm -hmm.
pray the prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious and loving God, we offer our prayers and these gifts to you in response to your great love for us. May these tokens of our love proclaim that the true reason for our joy this Christmas season is the birth of your love in human form in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 204.
Thank you. 